President Donald Trump says nothing will be off the table or off limits for his upcoming meeting with the President of Russia, Vladimir Putin. For more, we're joined by Peter Matthews, Professor of Political Science, who joins us now from the United States. Professor, thanks so much for your time. My pleasure being here. Thank you. Let's talk first about the Putin-Trump upcoming summit. We heard from President Trump on Air Force One saying you'd like to talk to uh, Mr Putin about everything. What do you think the main topics will be, though? And the main topics will be about the sanctions that are the U.S. has got on Russia and Putin wants them lifted, and also the uh, situation with Ukraine and, and the, the situation that many American people in the Senate want to make sure that, you, that Russia doesn't have too much influence or control over the Ukraine and, and to settle it in the conflict they might have there. The Ukraine will be a topic, and certainly other type of topics will be there as well when it comes to mainly geopolitical issues like Syria, for example. What about NATO as well? We know that that was something that uh, President Trump, while he was campaigning, really talked down, seemed to turn around on that. But now we're seeing uh, some bitter tensions between European leaders and President Trump when it comes to trade. So how do you think NATO will go between the two? Well, that's another issue of contention, because uh, what Putin feels is that NATO was brought right up to the former Soviet borders. And that was a threat to him in his point of view, as well as into the Baltic states. But the Europeans believe that the Baltic states have a right to be there because they want to have security for those states and not have any Russian threat to them. So it's a different point of view. And yet, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, President Trump has said that maybe NATO is not that important. And that's quite shocking to a lot of people. Mm. I think they've got to find a balance. They've got to find a way to, to set up the situation with NATO so that Russia doesn't feel overly threatened and acts aggressively in some ways in response. At the same time, the U.S. and the Western alliance should maintain NATO to be more of a peacekeeping force and not involved in too, in too many, uh, you know, situations where it seems provocative to Russia. There's a whole a traditional problem with the Soviet Union and Russia feeling like the West has been encircling them. That's the kind of thing that Putin's coming back and trying to resurrect the strength of the former Soviet Union. It's a major conflict problem. They have to work that out. It is a really interesting topic, um, this topic of Soviet Union compared to the United States, of course, because we know a lot of Republicans are not fans of President Putin and of the way that he runs his country, also the things that have happened in Crimea and, as you mentioned, Ukraine over the past couple of years. President Trump, as we know, has always been accused of having, having dealings with President Putin in the lead-up to that election, uh, but also business dealings that have gone back quite some time, including towers to be built in Moscow as well and trying to secure meetings with President Putin. So it's a very strange dynamic, isn't it? How do you think that will go? It's very strange and very unpredictable. That's the whole thing. And the main thing is there should be more transparency on the part of Putin, on the part of uh, President Trump. He's got to let people know what he's doing when he negotiates with Russia. And he had a meeting once with Russia where there was no one else there except his own translator, I mean, Putin's translator, and himself. That's not a way to build confidence in terms of transparency. He should include his advisors at these meetings and negotiations and make sure that there's a balance between the security of, the, of what Russia feels is their security and, of course, the Western alliance and the fact that the United States is the leader of NATO and the Western alliance. There has to be a balance there, and transparency is a very important part of that. The other one is elections. Uh, we know that there's still what the president is calling a witch hunt going on in the United States, of course, that investigation into him, into whether or not Russia interfered or, in fact, colluded with his campaign in the lead-up to that election at the start of last year. But then, at the same time, we've heard from Russia saying that they had no involvement. President Putin, uh, in a number of interviews since, denying any Russian interference or involvement in the US elections. President Trump flip-flopping on the issue, sometimes saying, look, uh, absolutely, we had nothing to do with the Russians and my campaign. We know that there have been a number of charges, but we also have seen uh, just yesterday on Air Force One President Trump talking about Russian interference, saying there should be no Russian interference with US elections. So what happens there? Well, he's going back and forth because of the contrary pushes and pulls to the whole issue, and that is the United States never wants to have anyone interfere in elections like they shouldn't, because we are a democracy that has to make our own choices. At the same time, there's, a, there's these charges that the intelligence services said that Russian interests were involved with, for example, buying ads on Facebook. Now, I think Putin is denying that the Russian government was involved, and that may be the case. But there were other Russian interests that were possibly involved in buying these ads on Facebook to try and disrupt the election and the electorate. So either way you look at it, the United States is a sovereign democracy and has every right to have its own elections without outside interference. But that's true of all countries, and we shouldn't interfere in the Russian elections either or try to propagandize in one way or the other. 
there has to be an accommodation here and a detente once again. And we need to pull the world back from this tremendous amount of tension, including the situation with Europe and with the, the trade and the tariffs that are going on now, which could start a huge trade war. It's already begun, actually, because of President Trump's actions mainly. And now we are facing the skyrocketing prices here. The inflation rates are going up. We have the stock market uh, gyrating. So these things have to be brought under control. And it takes a president with measured, careful, rational leadership without emotional basis to make these decisions and to keep transparency at the forefront so people are comfortable. Both our, our competitors and our allies have to be comfortable without the president is doing something in an honest way. You made a good point, essentially, about Russian plausible deniability. We've seen the Kremlin do that when it comes to MH17, um, that downed Malaysian Airlines jetliner that affected so many people around the world, including a number of Australians um, here in our country. That seems to be an ongoing thing with Russia, isn't it? Plausible deniability to say, look, it wasn't us in the Kremlin. We don't really know who did it. They may be supporters. We've seen it from time and time again with the killing of journalists in Russia as well, um, that we find out eventually of people who support President Putin but aren't necessarily linked to him. Then we have the other issue of the G7 that we heard President Trump talk about a few weeks ago. He wouldn't mind becoming the G8. Do you see that this is in some way um, setting the precedent for that to happen? Well, first of all, he sprang it on our allies without even warning them about it, and that was wrong. You didn't, you didn't inform our allies ahead of time and then talk to them and get their input on whether we should let Russia back in the G8 at this point. He didn't do it that way. It's the way he did it that was really anathema to many of our allies and even to our own people in the government that were caught off surprise that he made this, made this offer on the spur of the moment. I think President Trump should try to be more measured in his, his approach and to prepare himself for diplomacy rather than just shooting off the cuff with these kinds of comments and these proposals. So that has to be done once again. And you have to look at how Russia is going to be brought back in the G8 eventually, if it is, and what's needed, that we, what's required of them before they're allowed back in. And the president should not be shooting off the cuff in those kinds of very major decisions. Presidents always like the chance to be able to make changes to the Supreme Court because, as we know, it can help them to get through some of their contentious legislation if they get the right person in. There is now a vacancy after this week's retirement, I suppose, of Anthony Kennedy, you could say, announcing he's retiring on Thursday. What do you think will happen there? What's the prediction? Because we heard from the president uh, on Air Force One just hours ago saying he'll be making the decision in about a week's time and he's now down to five choices. Well, he and the Republicans want to push it through as fast as they can before the next election because there's a possibility, however slim, that the Senate could go back into Democratic hands, and even the House could, and that would make it very difficult for him to get another hardcore or hard right um, appointee through because the Senate, if it's in Democratic hands, they will make all kinds of requirements yeah. before they even approve a more moderate type of justice. He'd rather have a hard right justice, someone who would be a complete partner with Gorsuch, and they will have a very major, strong majority in favor of right-wing conservatism. Very concerning to a lot of people who are on the moderate side and the liberal side in America, that this country be pushed far to the right and rescinding a lot of our constitutional perfections and our individual freedoms. This has to be looked at carefully. A lot of women are concerned about the choice issue being overturned. So I think they're going to, the Republicans and President Trump are going to try to push this through as fast as they can, while Democrats are going to try to whip up support for winning over the Senate and to get people to tell them not to do that. People of America, of course, can have the final say if they got involved and acted in it. The big story as well this week has been that terrible shooting at the newspaper, the Capitol newspaper in Maryland, um, the state of Maryland, as we saw. We know that President Trump has had a very bizarre relationship with the press, with the media, as we know. He's called us fake news from time to time. Then there's Milo Yiannopoulos as well, his threats to journalists not apologising. How would you sum all this up? What's the one word we can say? It's not only flabbergasting, it's very uh, potentially damaging all around. And you have this tremendous distaste for the press that the president has had all this time and expressed. This is really very dangerous for democracy. The press is the fourth branch of government that has to keep those in power accountable and speak truth to power. But the president's been constantly vilifying them, calling them fake news. And in this case, uh, Milo actually went out and said, you know, that he could he had terrible things about he was waiting for some, uh, you know, what do you call the vigilante to shoot journalists. And they said it was a joke. That was completely unacceptable and outrageous. And I think there should be condemnation from all sides on that, including the Republicans, to tell Milos to just stop. And to, this could be a considered incitement, which could be prosecuted. It should never be allowed. And it was a horrible tragedy to see that around the same time that these people were being shot, Milos comes up with a horrendous statement saying that he was waiting for this type of thing to happen. Uh, it's un unconscionable and cannot be allowed. And, and the press intimidation is the most 
detrimental part of, a, of, a, to, of, the, of keeping democracy from flourishing. We've got to bring this back so we can have a democratic republic once again with no fear at all and full freedom of expression and freedom of press that our constitution guarantees. I guess we, we do all support the idea of freedom of the press, but we know that a lot of President Trump's allies, both supporters and those within the White House as well, do see organisations like the New York Times, the Washington Post as really campaigning against him, whatever it takes. What do we do about trying to bring the two groups together, or is that just impossible? It has to be done. If it's not done, this country will, will really suffer and continue to suffer in a very dangerous, unpredictable way. And we've got to bring the right and the left together and let them see that, look, we're both Americans. Both sides are Americans. We both have different views of how to get to the goal. But the goal is to bring prosperity, shared prosperity for everyone, not just for the 1%. And that has to be adhered to by both sides. And then they would pursue different methods of getting there. But to let's work out comp on compromise and consensus building in terms of what policy will be implemented. And they have, each side has to give and take some and to look for common ground. And if they don't do that, this country, the republic itself, is in big danger. And none of us wants that to happen because we love this country very much. Professor Matthews, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. My pleasure.